We are awaiting a historic meeting between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in. The leaders of these two nations have not met in more than a decade. Their summit comes just one week after Kim announced that North Korea would suspend its nuclear and missile testing. President Trump has said he plans to meet with Kim Jong-un in May or June. But as we look at this picture, it cannot be overstated the historic nature of what we are witnessing now. These pictures coming to us outside the Peace House on the southern side of the demilitarized zone that divides the two countries. There you see the two leaders of North Korea and South Korea shaking hands in a demonstration of uh, certainly attempted unity here, but there is much at stake. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, a potential peace settlement between the two countries, and improvement of inter-Korea relations. Let's go ahead and bring in Isaac Stonefish uh, as we continue to watch these pictures. Isaac is a senior fellow at the Asia Society and a CBSN contributor. Uh, let's look at these pictures, Isaac, and have you give us your sense of the historic nature of what we are witnessing taking place at this moment. It's certainly incredibly significant to see these two men meeting with expectations of peace being so high. And I think a lot of people have talked about the shift from where we are today and where we were several months ago. And I think to inject a note of pessimism into things, it's important to remember that even though the two leaders are smiling and posing with children right now, it is still very possible a few months from now, tensions will go back to where they were. Give us a sense of the context. Why now? Why is it that this summit is possible between these two leaders? You know, it's hard to know how much credit to give to Trump's sanctions and his maximum pressure policy mm -hmm. and how much credit to give to Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, feeling secure at home, feeling that he's consolidated enough power domestically, feeling that he now has enough of a nuclear and weapons arsenal that he can negotiate, if not from a position of strength, then a position that he's comfortable that he'll be able to stay in power. And what is precisely at stake here? I mean, I mentioned denuclearization. It seems that an agreed upon definition of that has not even been established yet. That's an excellent point. We, we don't know fully what the North Korean side thinks of it. We, we think that when they say denuclearization, they mean U.S. troops, there's roughly 30,000 of them, out of South Korea, the end of the U.S. nuclear umbrella over South Korea, and then the North Korean side to take its time to think about what to do with its nuclear weapons. But so much is at stake because we don't know how big of a threat North Korea poses to the U.S., to South Korea, to Japan. We know it certainly poses a major threat to its own people. But this summit could really change both the perception and the reality of North Korea as a regional and domestic threat. Let's go ahead and listen in to this welcoming ceremony, and um, we'll go ahead and come back in just a moment. Let's listen in.
All right, as we continue to watch these pictures uh, along with Isaac Stonefish here, one cannot help but be struck by the pomp and circumstance, the pageantry of this welcoming ceremony, Isaac. Explain to us why, in particularly this situation, the optics absolutely matter for Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is decades younger than his South Korean counterpart. He runs a nation that has roughly half the population, is far poorer on every metric, and yet as we see these two men walking together, they're being treated as equals. And that is so important to Kim Jong-un, is so important to his place in the world that you know one hopes he will be willing to negotiate and to give up more than he would have otherwise if he were treated as a junior partner. So as we watch these images continue to unfold, uh, you noted before not to inject a note of skepticism. However, has the North Korean regime going back decades, have they been to this point before where they have perhaps made an initial pledge uh, in which they have said, yes, we are willing to sit down and perhaps uh, consider some of the demands um, by some of those, including in the West, um, and then proceeded to just essentially allow the clock to run on, for instance, uh, an American president's administration and only to continue with their development of their nuclear weapons program. They certainly have. I think the best example for that is the summit in 2000, which was met with really, really high hopes. And the U.S. Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, went to Pyongyang. She met Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, and people were quite optimistic. And then Bush took office and tensions began to simmer. Uh, Bush called Kim Jong-il a pygmy, and that didn't really bode well for ties between the two nations. But there's never... It's, it's hard to say that this is unprecedented. Really, what's, what's different here is the looming meeting between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That's something that has never happened before, and that is something about... It's a, it's a massively important event with two very unpredictable leaders, and it could go many different directions. And so for those people who had initially viewed President Trump's rhetoric, uh, the bombastic fire and fury comments, for instance, when referring to North Korea, um, for those who were initially perhaps critical of that strategy, where do those critics find themselves now when you have a North Korean leader who says that perhaps he is open to things um, during uh, these potential talks or beginnings of talks? That's, some would argue, progress. Those people who would argue the president's unpredictability is what has allowed dialogue to at least the beginnings of dialogue to at least start. So I think those critics find themselves right here in, in my shoes. And <laughs> the you can't say that Trump gets credit for arranging a meeting with the North Korean leader because North Korean leaders have wanted to meet with the American president for decades. Mm -hmm. It's you know, they would have met with Obama very, very easily. Regardless of who was in the Regardless. Office. They just want to get legitimacy by meeting with an American president. So I, I think it's possible that Trump's strategy of maximum pressure and, and his bombast helped pave the way for it, but it's also possible that it just made things a lot more dangerous before, mm -hmm. made North Korea rush to finish reaching a capability that it felt comfortable defending itself on and puts the U.S. in a worse position than it would have otherwise. Let's talk about the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in. What does he get out of this, what we are seeing right here at this welcoming ceremony? I think he gets to finish, in a degree, the work that he started when he was in the administration of a former South Korean president, Kim, 2007. He was, I believe, the chief of staff and involved in arranging a summit meeting, and now he's the one who gets to go and meet and represent the South Korean people. And I also think that it's hard to imagine a scenario of peace between North and South Korea that doesn't start with a meeting between the two leaders. And that's not to say that this meeting will 
lead to peace. It's impossible to say, but mm -hmm. this really feels like it's a step in that direction. And Moon gets to say, regardless of what happens, that he helped take his country there. Because for Koreans, both North Koreans and South Koreans, these images that we are seeing here, these are not images they have seen before, necessarily. I haven't seen him. I mean, Kim Jong-un is different than his father. His father, Kim Jong-il, was the one who met with the South Korean president in 2000 and a different South Korean president in 2007. And unlike Kim Il-sung, the founding leader of North Korea, who ruled for 45 years, and unlike Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il was not a charismatic man. He was, he was not someone who really inspired confidence. And Kim Jong-un, for all of his faults and for you know, his severe curtail of human rights and or that he is a dictator, plain and simple, mm -hmm. is far more charismatic than his father and is much more comfortable in front of an audience, is, is more of a retail politician a la kissing babies and shaking hands mm -hmm. than his father was. And I think that that translates and that will send a different message to South Korean viewers. So if you are the United States, if you are President Trump watching these pictures um, from uh, the demilitarized zone there, what are we watching for? What are you looking for coming out of this meeting? So I imagine Trump is not going to be watching this himself. It's not mm -hmm. really the kind of thing that he tends to spend time on. But mm -hmm. I, I think his advisors and the people trying to profile Kim Jong-un are really just so hungry for psychological and biographical details about the man, about how he moves, what he does, how he engages. So I think there's going to be a lot of very careful analysis of, of just who he is as a person. He's still a very mysterious person. We know very little about him. And it's rare to get all of this footage that's not coming directly from the North Koreans. Would a formal end to the Korean War ease tensions on other issues? I think it certainly would ease tensions on other issues and it would also make U.S. policy in Asia and in the world is quite different because right now Trump expends a lot of energy trying to get other countries to join him on his North Korea policy, especially with China, especially in the U.S. relationship with China. So if the two sides were able to come to a peace treaty or a peace agreement or if after this summit between Trump and Kim, uh, if it happens, it's still not entirely confirmed. Uh, if that would to lead to peace, I think it would make for a smoother relationship with other countries. If you're just joining us, we are watching these pictures coming in live. A meeting set to take place at the Peace House on the southern side of the demilitarized zone that divides North and South Korea. There you see North Korean leader Kim Jong-un walking in along with South Korean President Moon Jae-in. And Isaac, as they do that, tell us about what we can expect for their agenda items here. Walk us through that. So denuclearization is the big one. And as we mentioned, different ideas on both sides as to what actually that means, but I'll almost certainly talk about that. The other is the question of a peace treaty and, and how to resolve some of these historic issues of the 1950 to 1953 Korean War, which is still very, very present for North Korea. You know, North Korea likes to communicate to its citizens that they are still at war, that they're living in this very traumatic time and that the leaders have to protect them from the Americans, the Japanese, even the South Koreans to an extent. So that's a big issue, especially on the North Korean side, but also on the South Korean side. And then the third issue they said is on inter-Korean relations. And that's much vaguer, but that could take the, that could come in as meetings between families on the north and south side who were separated during the Korean War, or on the reopening of an industrial zone in, uh, near the border between the two Koreas that symbolizes economic development and trade between the two sides. What about China? Uh, how do Chinese officials view these latest developments, especially at a time when the American president has said very clearly that he intends to, if conditions are right, if everything seems like it will be fruitful, he intends to sit down with Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader? I think Beijing is very split about North Korea coming in from the cold. On the one hand, North Korea has been an embarrassment for them. They're trying to portray themselves as a responsible power. And their relationship with North Korea 
makes that hard. It belies that notion. On the other hand, I think they're worried about North Korea peeling away from the Chinese orbit, moving closer to South Korea, moving closer to the United States. Geographically, North Korea is very important to China. It's a buffer between those 30,000 American troops in South Korea. And if North Korea were to start tilt towards the Americans, sort of like China did in the 70s after Nixon visited, it tilted towards the Americans away from the Russians. This would be a bit of a strategic headache for China and something that it might work to prevent. On the issue of denuclearization, what realistically is the leverage that the United States has in order to try and get North Korea to carry out denuclearization as the U.S. has defined it, completely giving up its nuclear weapons? I think some of the worries about the existence of this meeting between North and South Korea and the meeting between Trump and Kim Jong-un is that one of the things the North Korean side really wanted was a meeting. And I think there have been some people who have been critical of the administration for agreeing to a meeting so quickly without getting more confirmations from the North Koreans. I think one thing that the U.S. side could be asking for is the ability to go in and inspect various North Korean nuclear sites. They were able to do that in the past, in the early 2000s, and then that fell apart as, as tensions worsened. But I think we could see a push more for that in the future. Mm -hmm.